Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had an enjoyable, enjoyable lunch. Um, and welcome to this session regarding care and long-term care. And can the state afford not to get involved in long-term care? Um, we have a panel for this session, um, rather than a presentation and discussion. We've got five very eminent experts on care and the development of care in Asia to share their experience with you. Um, moderating this uh, panel, we have Ms. Hiroko, who is a financial sector specialist of public management in the Asian Development Bank. Um, and she has over 20 years' experience in social security development, public finance, and governance. So thank you very much, Ms. Hiroko, for agreeing to do this. And uh, to introduce the other panelists, I'll now hand over to Ms. Hiroko. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for gathering, gathering for this session. Uh, let me first introduce our panels. First, from my left hand side, uh, Mr. Sunnam Kum is the chief health uh, sector group of the Asia, Asian Development Bank. Before joining the ADB, he was the president of the Korean Association of Schools of Public Health. Um, he is very. Uh, he has excellent expertise in the health economics area in terms of both of the academic analysis as well as the uh, policy analysis. And Ms. Kim Cho, she is the chief program of Hum May Center for Successful Aging, the Chao Foundation's collective of seven pioneer aged care, age care program. She has very experience in the practitioner and then the also integrated care approaches. She is a project leader for a community-wide approach to um, plan the inter integrated system of comprehensive program and services to promote health, well-being, and enabling aging in place. And Mr. Cho, he is the president of Health Age Korea. Uh, he works for the he works with uh, with the ASEM, ASEM governments to focus on the community care mostly and consulted for the ASEAN Secretariat, uh, Ministry of the Social Welfare and then Labor, Migrant Workers Division, and also with the Minister of Health. So he had the experiences uh, to build the policies with those ministries. At the same time, it's the provision by the uh, NGO in ASEAN countries. And Mr. Bijai, he was the... Um, he served for the Ministry of Public Health, including the Secretary General of Food and Drug Administration of Thailand before, and currently he is a member of the Quality Control Committee under the National Health Secretary Act. Also, he is the president of the Senior Citizen Council of Thailand, so he is also uh, present both, uh, both of the senior citizens now. I think. Okay. So, uh, Question for this session is that if the government, is it possible for the government not to get involved in long-term care? So as we already discussed since uh, yesterday, the, we have the strong tradition of family care in Asia. However, economic and social trends are creating the significant gaps in care for older. Meeting the care needs of the rapidly aging population is an um, Critical, critically serious for the policy concern the Asian country. There's not only, uh, not only more people in need for care, at the same time, fewer people of working age able to contribute uh, practically and financially uh, towards that care. So despite this constraints, government have some options in how they address those gaps and inaction of the government they may lead to the even greater cost. So this session will discuss why government should consider policy options to minimize this burden of family or individuals and maximize the contribution that people in later life can make to the, uh, can make. And so this session will focus on the barrier variables, factors that will affect how society, supported by the government, uh, manage the long-term care implications of the population aging. 
so first of all, we like to ask the Mr. Sunnam about the, how the government can start uh, to evaluate the cost investment returns in the long-term care services, such as the economic, social cost, and the investment and returns. Uh, we know there is not much uh, evidence here, so we'd like to, but then we'd like to ask you from the uh, experiences and then current initiatives, recent initiatives in this aspect. Well, I think um, I'd better mention that the benefit side of uh, benefits of uh, investing in long-term care systems. I think um, what is the it, the benefit depends on, or, or the definition of measurement of benefit depends on what is the objective of the long-term care system. Well, these days we talk a lot about UHC. I think we apply that concept to the long-term care system probably. The goal, objective, is to ensure a quality long-term care for all the people without financial hardship. Okay. So probably there are benefits from or improvement in, in functional status or improvement in happiness, welfare, and, and, and decrease in financial uh, hardship or increase in financial protection. So they probably can result in uh, increased cap capacity to consume, in a sense, because they can save the kind of catastrophic cost related to long-term care. So, how to measure the improvement in in the or health outcomes or or improved happiness level for elderly plus increased consumption level? That might be from a conceptual perspective can be the starting point for uh, the benefits of introducing long-term care system, but. These two are a bit, a bit too conceptual and um, or theoretical. Uh, so we can decompose. I mean, I've been, uh, before joining ADB half years ago, I've, I've worked a lot uh, with the Korean government when Korea introduced a long-term care insurance system eight years ago. So I, even I did the cost-benefit analysis uh, for the introduction of long-term care insurance funded by the government. So we, de we can de decompose some of those Benefit side, benefits of uh, uh, long-term care systems into several dimensions. Well, one of the potential arguments can be, well, there are a lot of interactions between healthcare and long-term care system, right? And if we have a good long-term care, then we can save some of the healthcare costs. Hmm? Well, we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have many Evidence is available in, in the context of Asia, but there are many evidences in, in OECD countries, for example. They said, I mean, when there is, no, when there is not a good long-term care system available or supplied, then people, old people, they tend to stay longer in long-term care, I mean, in acute care hospitals, so-called social admissions. It's costly. Okay? And at the same time, it is possible that Long-term care system can contribute to the, the, the functional state, not only the functional state, but overall health of all the people. So the need for health care can be maintained or even decreased if you have a good long-term care system. Okay. There is one aspect. Another dimension can be, if you don't have a long-term care system, who is, who is, uh, who are, providing long-term care for all, but usually family members, relatives, so-called informal caregivers. So there is some sacrifice in terms of labor participation because they cannot participate in labor because they have to provide long-term care for their family mem member or persons. So sacrifice, we can reduce this type of sacrifice or social cost related to the non, I mean, labor non-participation. So that they might be another kind of a part of the benefits. And if we stretch a bit, I would say stretch, it might have a positive impact on the employment, right? Because um, if there's a long-term care system, of course, there's different types of care, continuum of care. 
But we can, to some extent, we socialize the caregiving. So the care is now provided a lot by formal care providers. So there's an increase in, in the labor force or employment of these care providers. So there's an increase in labor force part, potentially, this part. And if, if you stretch up even further, we can say why, if, if we have a good long-term care financing system, then, and if the benefit package is very extensive, then, you know, benefit package not only increases the service provision, but also some, you know, devices, right, equipment for all the population. So there's even potential positive impact on, on the, that industry development perspective. These are the potential kind of a categories of benefits of introducing good uh, long-term care system. Of course, that means these, these potential benefits becomes a cost of not introducing a good long-term care system. But as I said, whether these type of benefits are realized or not, it depends on the context of many countries. But these are, I mean, as a start level, I can show these are the potential benefits. Okay, so what I understand, so um, cost, in terms of cost, the, the other way around, it's the benefits we can think about it. So first of all, that you mentioned about the health condition. If we have the long, good long-term care system, we, that would uh, ex, ex, uh, ex, increase the possibility for the elder people to keep the good health condition. That, uh, the other, uh, on the other hand, may reduce the uh, medical cost. And that's the maybe first and indirect uh, impact if we have the good long-term care system supported by the government. And the second point is, yeah, exactly the, since yesterday we talk about the workforce, the laborers' uh, possibilities. Uh, as you mentioned, it's, uh, there's a lot unpaid uh, provision of the long-term care in Asia. That's by the family members, mostly the women and sometimes the men also. So then if we have the system to provide long-term care services, that's increased the possibility for those people to go to the formal labor market. And then the third one is like, as you mentioned, exactly the, this is the issue. It's currently, I know, they're talking about in China. This would be the job creation possibility to expand if they have the formal, formal market of the long-term care service provision. And the fourth one, is my, my understanding is, if I'm wrong, please correct me, but my understanding, if we have the good financial scheme to finance long-term care uh, service provision, that would uh, expand the possibility to explore the new market. Is that so this will be the potential, uh, I think I, we, we can say the not cost, but the more like a benefit to uh, invest in the long-term care services industry, not only the, you know, the for informal market, but, for the, but more by the government have, may have the more incentive or they may need to, uh, they, uh, they may need to start to invest in this area. That's the, I think, the Mr. Sunnam, the major message for this uh, issue. So let us continue to ask at the, ask to the Ms. Cho, uh, uh, no, sorry, Ms. Kim Cho. Uh, what we'd like to ask you is like, um, responsibility, Who, whose responsibility? So now we are talking about the, the cost or benefits, the investment by the government. So we'd like to ask you the, who is the responsibility, how we can share the responsibility to provide the services among the family, individual, and the uh, community, and also the government. So Singapore has taken a strong stance that individual families are primarily responsibility for financing the, financing the services before the government. However, the government still makes us uh, critical investment in long-term care. So what does the government see its role? And then what are the key investments it makes in the long-term care? Right. Um, thank you. So what, what I'm going to share is really some observations that, uh, that I have with regard to 
um, the, the current scene in Singapore. I, I think all of you know here, Singapore is, I think, the second fastest growing, growing older in, in, in Asia, you know, in Asia. And, um, and traditionally, you know, for a long time, the way the um, services, whether it's healthcare or social services, are organized, is really based on what uh, our government call a many hands approach, uh, which basically looks at three different levels of um, of of uh, intervention. Uh, you know, the first level being the individual and the family, which means that you know um, the individual and the family are the first line of. Um, uh, you know the the first line to to actually provide the the care or the help to whoever is in need to the individual in need. So it's the family and the the, fam- the family and the individual. And then the second line is really the community, uh, which means civic organisations, VWOs, and and then come the government. So the government steps in when um, the other two can't do the job, then the government will step in. And for many years that has been the the approach that the our government has taken. Um, I think since maybe about starting five years ago, we, we can see that um, that approach still stays, but there has been increasingly an observation that that approach is being redefined You know, um, with all the data that is coming in with regard to the number of older persons and also some of the um, phenomena we are seeing on the ground. Like, for instance, uh, we see a lot of Older people just coming in and out of hospital, and uh, in in like in, in in our country, we kind of joke about it and say, "Oh, these are the frequent flyers," you know. But we, we begin to see that kind of phenomenon, and there is like a crunch in nursing homes, for instance. You know, not enough homes, not enough day centers to go around. And I think all these kind of warning signs probably add to the um, that that change. That evolve, the evolving in terms of how we're going to redefine this many hands approach. So um, some of the, so some of what's happening is just like, for instance, so what what has changed? What has been redefined? I think first and foremost, it's really very much um, the worldview that that the government has taken. I think for for a long time, you know, aging has always been described as a tsunami. Uh, the silver tsunami, uh, the burden of aging, but you know, but recently, what we're beginning to hear is, you know, s- instead of aging, we use longevity. Uh, we talk about celebrating longevity. We talk about longevity being an opportunity. So, from that perspective, there is that that change, that starting that change in the worldview, and I think it's best epitomized by actually the the direction, the policy direction that. Our healthcare system has taken um, that recently. The health ministry actually listed down three different directions for for the healthcare system. One is from healthcare to health, which means really you're looking at a, you're really looking at developing the health of the nation, and you're not just looking at healthcare, right? Then the other one is from hospital to community. Uh, the third one is from quality to value, which is really about productivity. So I think with these three directions that. The, the health ministry have, li- have outlined, you can see there is a shift in, in, in the worldview of, of how we look at aged care in, in Singapore. So that is a quite, to, to us, it's quite a fundamental shift. So that's one. The other one is really very much about building the infrastructure, the infrastructure to, to support this shift, you know. And some of the, the, the components that we can see in this uh, development of infrastructure is really around, like for instance, um, developing community-based services. That is now a very big push to develop community-based services, and at the same time, to re to 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 look at um, hospital care in terms of a regional health system. So all our hospital, we've got like six major hospitals in Singapore, right? So all of them are now organized into a regional health system. And with this regional health system, one of the main focus of this regional health system is really how they work with the community so that there, there is that seamless interface. So, so this is one of the things in terms of the infrastructure development. It's really the push towards community-based care, reorganize healthcare into regional health systems. Um, the other thing is really looking at 
Uh, we, we also have uh, about maybe three, four years ago, there is, we, the, the government uh, the, had this, uh, started this aging planning office. This aging planning office was organized, was uh, established actually, to really coordinate all the care around older people. So uh, coordinate the care across health and social, for instance, and even with the other ministries like transport, for instance. So that, that's another one. The other thing is really around the funding. Um, traditionally, the funding, funding design in Singapore is such that it follows the, um, the program, right? So if it follows, so the, the fundings are based on the program. If you run a certain program, the government will fund or co, co-pay, co-fund with, with the individual as well as the, the voluntary organization, for instance, who's running the, the, the program. And if the individual cannot pay, then you know you get means tested and to, to look at how much you can pay. So traditionally, that funding has been like that. That I don't think will change. But what we are experimenting with now, or rather our government is experimenting with now, is what uh, is capitated funding. Fun- that means you know, funding based on care bundles. So that, that's now the new experiment happening in, uh, in long-term care in Singapore. So in terms of funding design, there's been some shift, some, some like I said, experiments. The other one is really developing a, a, a legal structure. In the last maybe about two or three years ago, we have this Mental Capacity Act, which really looking at you know, um, for people who, people like, for instance, people with dementia who can't care for themselves, then to appoint a, 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 a what we call a donor who, who can then take over that care, you know, when that person lost that capacity. The next one to come is actually our Vulnerable Persons Act, which is really looking at, for instance, elder abuse. So in, in, the, in the legal structure, some things have been, are being done as well. Uh, so, so there is quite a lot of infrastructure development in, in that area. The other big area is actually capacity building, uh, particularly in terms of uh, direct care workers. So for instance, if you are Singaporean and you want to, um, you know, like if you're a housewife and you decided that, oh, I want to go back to work and I, I, would, I do not mind being a, a direct care worker working either in, say, a, a home, a, a nursing home or a daycare center, and you want to get training for that, it's um, you know, the government subsidized practically 95% of that training fees. So you just need to pay 5%. So it's very, very uh, accessible, you know, to people who want to, to be trained. And the other area is nurses, you know, looking at training nurses to be able to work in the community rather than just hospital. So, so, in, so in terms of um, investment, at long-term care investment, I think this is, these are some of the areas that... Um, what, what our government is, has been doing. It's just started, so it's still early days from that perspective. And, and so I guess, you know, at the base, that whole, that many hand of, hands approach will not change. But in terms of the investment, I, I do see that these are some of the investment that has been made. So I think then it begs the questions of, with all this new development, then what is the role of the family? You know, how would the family be, you know, moving forward? And I think also the, the role of the community. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's very interesting to know the uh, recent initiative in uh, Singapore. So just just, just uh, briefly summarize what's the area and scope of the government recently working on is the one is the policy direction and then quality to the value and the hospital to the community. And second is the infrastructure. That's also try to more expand to the community basis. And third is the coordination of the all stakeholders to provide the services. Fourth is the funding. Yes, this is the usually the core area for the government, but again, so co-finance. And then five is the legal framework. This is also a major area for the government to work on the other countries as well. And then six is the capacity development of the providers. Okay. It's, thank you very much. So we just go, go to the uh, next question for the Mr. Uh, Cho. So um, your organization Help Age Career, an NGO, has been working care for many years now. 
And what, not only in, the, in Korea, but also in uh, working with the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare and NGO in many of ASEAN countries to promote the model of volunteer-based uh, home and community-based care. So then our question for you is that what the role do the social organizations such as NGO have to play in a system of care and what can government actually to support that kind of initiatives? Uh, Happy Korea, as you, as you mentioned, Happy Korea has been uh, working with 10 ASEAN members uh, for more than 10 years. Uh, the purpose uh, was to introduce Korean model, Korean home care model uh, to each country. Uh, and uh, the, the first objective is to develop the the localized home care model in each country, except Singapore, because Singapore has very well, uh, you know, the established model. Um, and second objective uh, is to uh, influence government to take it as a policy. What I want to uh, the share uh, here in this session is that uh, uh, that's the experience in low and middle income countries experience not in in Korea but before uh, I want to I want to share some experience in Korea because when we approach to the each country in low and middle income countries including Myanmar Cambodia and Laos and other Indonesia they told told me that oh this is Korean model Korea already well developed. You have a budget. You have a, you know lots of experience, and you already have uh, you know the the, the pr priority on the aging issue. So it was not easy to you know the, the introduce our model at that time. It was uh, 2004, but uh, that time I sh I shared the Korean experience in the beginning. The Korean experience of that years not. Not that years, 2004, but Korean experience in 1987. In 1987, before the 1987, Korean government uh, ha had a policy that the care, this care responsibility is on, on family, not, not the government. And in 1987, changed the policy to home care, to support NGO, uh, to implement home care in one area by one NGO. That, that was the Heritage Korea. That time, the population of older people over 65 was 4.5%, uh, not 12%, 4.5% over 65 years old. And after that, uh, the NGO, as an NGO, we try to push government to, to allocate more money to expand this home care model nationwide. So from the 2000, uh, one, 1987 to 2007, before, before the long-term care insurance in 2008, it took almost 20 years. Um, the number of uh, service provider, I mean the NGO was a service provider, was increased uh, from one organization to 760 organizations. At that time, you know, the, in 2007, the percentage of the older people over 65 was 10%. It was 10%. So, um, I explained this experience in, in Korea to the, to the middle and low income countries that that time we have faced the same, uh, you know, the issues that government uh, thought that the, this responsibility is not the government responsibility but the family responsibility. And then we try to uh, push it to government to take it as a policy. And I, I, I can give you one more example, one more, uh, you know, the information on, uh, in Korea. Now at the moment, we have a long-term care insurance system. And in 2015, we have 12,000 
thousand service providers. So, so I, I'm not going to explain uh, what's the long-term care insurance system in Korea, but I want to uh, share the the experience of 20 years, 20 years experience before the long-term care insurance from 2000, uh, 1987 to 2007. And then we, we uh, share this experience to the 10 Asian countries, except Singapore, and that, uh, try to uh, develop their own model in each country uh, for more than 10 years. And then we could get a good performance. Uh, we could, uh, you know, develop, localized, you know, the, the, the model in many countries. Uh, but uh, the, there are two, two types of delivery system that uh, the service provider depends on the service provider. In Korea, the service providers are NGO. So in Indonesia, in Malaysia, uh, in I think in Thailand also, they, uh, the service providers are NGOs and supported by the government. But in other countries like Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Philippines, there was no much uh, NGOs or social, uh, civil society organization in, it, in that area. So we approach uh, older people's association uh, and then enhance the capacity to provide this home care in, in that area. And finally, uh, we could get a good you know, the, uh, achievement, which means that uh, five countries uh, accept the home care, uh, this policy as their own policy. Indonesia, and Cambodia, and Philippines, Malaysia, and uh, Vietnam as well. So um, it was good uh, uh, experience for us um, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, share the Korean model to the middle and low income countries. And then we could, we could show that uh, in, even though in the middle and low income countries, uh, there are needs. There are needs of care for older people in a village level. And we can establish this infrastructure in still in a middle and low income countries. Uh, I know that uh, there is a, a still uh, limitations uh, and challenges. Even though there is a policy, if the government uh, doesn't allocate uh, the, the, the budget or uh, doesn't de develop action plan, uh, uh, there, there might be no implementation at, at the village level. But uh, I think this is an indicator that uh, in even in a middle and low income countries, there are needs and we can establish infrastructure to provide uh, these care services for the older people. Thank you. Yes. I fully agree with you that even though the middle, middle income and low income countries definitely there the needs for cares and how to uh, meet the needs is the issue for the government, also the community and the families. I could see the, the, your, you know, the information based on the Korean experiences and then that's localized in the ASEAN countries. So um, government definitely they shifting, as uh, me, Kim Cho, Ms. Kim Cho says, they shifting also the direction how to involve in the, these areas. And also NGO, they have the significant important uh, role in particularly the providing the services, community-based and home-based uh, services. That's quite interesting to know the home-based uh, care policies has accepted, uh, accepted uh, five ASEAN countries. Okay, thank you. The next is the Mr. Bijai. Uh, we uh, so the in Thailand government, Thailand recently approved a budget of six million Thai bars to support the development of the care system, focusing on the home-based care for the those in need. So we'd like to ask you what was the process leading up this decision, and what's the background, and what are the priority in Thailand, and why. Uh, and also, please tell us the why will be the indicator of success. Uh, 
I'm trying to answer uh, the question. Uh, in 2015, uh, Thai government approved a budget of uh, 600 million baht. It's about uh, 17 million US dollar to support the development of care systems, focusing on providing home-based care for the most needy. Uh, uh, just start with the uh, basic information. Thailand has a population of uh, 65 million, and 10 million now are older persons, with uh, about 8.4 million still uh, healthy, and about 1.6 million need uh, some uh, level of long-term care. Uh, and uh, in, 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 in this group, uh, there are some, uh, some persons that need uh, hospital care that uh, that uh, already covered by universal, universal health care coverage since 2002. Uh, population age uh, 60 or over living independently alone or with spouse uh, for male in Thailand is 16.8% and female is 21.3%. This is the figure uh, Professor Takebi presented to us uh, yesterday. Uh, that means uh, most of the elderly people uh, in Thailand live with their family. Uh, the initiative for this program was started by National Health Security Office, uh, who is responsible for uh, USC program. Uh, after successfully established health promotion fund at local level nationwide, this is more than 7,500 funds uh, uh, nationwide. Uh, we start with uh, only 45 Thai baht per person, per person uh, from National Health Security Office. And then we ask the local government to give a counter budget, uh, about 20 to 50 percent, uh, uh, depend on the size of the local government. If the if the local government is the small, the uh, the uh, uh, counter budget is uh, about twenty percent. But for the municipality, a bigger one, they uh, they uh, uh, participate about fifty percent. Uh, the step the, we first we prepare the strategic plan for long term care. We involve all stakeholders from uh, every government organization, every ministry, uh, from many, many NGOs, and from academic. Uh, we learn from other countries, especially from Japan. Uh, during we develop this uh, strategic plan, uh, we, uh, we, we have a study visit uh, to Japan, because uh, Japan has a, a long uh, experience and, uh, and, and a very rich experience for us to learn. And uh, we have conduct a consultative meeting uh, during uh, preparation of the strategic plan. And we do a lot of uh, documentary research and also a lot of uh, action research uh, before we, uh, we, 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 we prepare this. Uh, then, uh, when we when we start, uh, we discuss about the policy, and then we conclude that we will promote home-based care and community care. This is the uh, le uh, the lesson learned from Japan, because uh, uh, f some of uh, Japanese told us that don't follow Japan way, because uh, we uh, they invest a lot in institutional care. For Home for the elderly, that uh, that is very 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 costly. You can uh, we cannot afford uh, when uh, the uh, economic crisis or economic uh, stagnation. Yeah. And also we learn from Thai experience. Uh, in 1950, the case uh, we uh, established the first home for the elderly at the Bangkok. Bangkok is a suburb of Bangkok. This is the first one. Uh, at that time, I, 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 I was uh, really young. And uh, uh, my, my friend, he is uh, about 20 years older than me, told me that 
at the at the opening ceremony uh, miss nilawan miss nilawan pintong she is the secretary to the uh, to the prime minister wife who chair the opening ceremony she said that she said at that ceremony that we do a bit take we distract all the people from their family and community uh, maybe this is the the idea at that time and maybe because uh, uh, at that time, we are low-income country, so we can establish uh, the home for the elderly, very few uh, nationwide. Miss Nilawan received a Maxxasai Award later. Uh, and we, uh, we did a compilation study, uh, compare the cost, uh, the cost of long-term care in a home, in a Thampapakorn house, is uh, for the elderly, which is, which is uh, uh, the government uh, house for elderly in Chiang Mai province, and uh, compared to uh, the the system in a district in central uh, central uh, central of Thailand in Lam Son Thi in Lopuli province, and we found that the cost in the institution is about ten times more than home based care. So we, uh, so we finished our, our strategic plan. And the plan was scrutinized by the subcommittee on financing of National Health Security Board in 2013 to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to ask two questions. One is the cost benefit of the, uh, of the plan. And then the, co the burden of the budget uh, can be afforded. Yeah. And finally, uh, this plan was uh, passed. It was approved by National Health Security Board in uh, 2013. Uh, it is uh, 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 this, uh, this board chaired by the Minister of Public Health. And I, I also uh, sub uh, submit this plan to the National Committee on Injury, uh, which are uh, chaired by the Prime Minister, and this uh, this plan also approved uh, in uh, in the same year. Uh, and in uh, 2014, first about a budget for pilot program was approved for about 1,000 district. Uh, total is allowed 7,800 uh, district. And one district uh, has about uh, 5,000 5, to 10,000 population. And we found that in, in, the, uh, in, in, in that area, uh, there, there, there are, uh, there are uh, older persons who need long-term care, about 20 to 40 persons. And most of the money will uh, go to the caregiver and care manager. Uh, this is the only financing system. We we also we already have uh, our uh, infrastructure at the provision level. We have we have a provision hospital, a, a big one, and then at district level we have every uh, we have every district uh, a community hospital, uh, range from thirty to two hundred beds, and at uh, at uh, sub district level we have a health center. And uh, in every village, we have health volunteer. Health volunteer is the, now is allowed uh, one million uh, uh, world, uh, nationwide. Uh, the budget uh, the budget was uh, earmarked five thousand to the local government, and one uh, one million thousand uh, one hundred million thousand to healthcare system, uh, and. Uh, Okay, uh, this is all uh, what I want uh, to, to, to share. And I, 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 I would like to say that there will be a lot of problems, there will be a lot of hard work to do because planning, somebody said that planning is their dream. Implementation is hard working and evaluation will be like a torture. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Um, uh, I may, it, it's good to know you run from the Japan's experiences, and then you uh, shifted the uh, policy not to facility based, but the community and the home care basis. And also interested to know the Thailand government, they did the cost analysis to re realistically think about what the government can do with the limited budget. And that's also give us the implication for another ASEAN countries, also the another middle income, low middle income countries within a limited budget, but still the government can start to do something. And for that, good planning. And then I, I, it was very interesting to know also the government did the detailed analysis of the supply side uh, capacity close to the local, each of the locality. That's, uh, I think that's very important implication to give us the other countries. Okay, so we have a bit more than half an hour, so I'd like to open the floor to have the uh, questions and comment reflections. Well, thank you very much. I'm Arun Myra from HelpAge International. Um, this panel was um, really heartwarming because you're talking about uh, solutions, and uh, I think solutions which uh, feel right also. The three models, if I may say that uh, one was hearing, and they may be very similar, uh, but to compare uh, them might be helpful. One was the Korean model, Mr. Cho, which, as you said, you took and then it's been adapted. You went to Japan and you said, that's where you thought you'd get your model, and you did. And what they suggested to you was to use a home care system just like uh, Mr. Cho had, but maybe it was different in the ideas. And Singapore has its own model, but also directed towards that. Amongst the three of you, what um, would you uh, um, say are uh, uh, principal differences, if any, in the three models? and what is the essential common features of them? I'm Kimraj from Nepal. There are two extreme thoughts. If I spoil my health in my young age, why government should be responsible for caring in my old age? One extreme thought. Other one is current system, practice, policy deprive me to build my health, and then why government should not be responsible? So where is the way out? Do you have any ideas on that? So my name is Hoang, uh, Vietnam. I would like to uh, have two questions. The first question, can you explain more the PPP mechanism uh, you apply for the long-term care? long-term health care, uh, because uh, the most important, if you mobilize uh, some uh, the participation of the old uh, sector, private sector, or public sector, or family, yes, maybe you will uh, set up about the mechanism. Uh, PPP is the most important. You explain more. The uh, second question, I would like to, uh, to think about how to low cost of the long-term health care. Because if you want to, how to uh, apply ICT use the, for the uh, long-term health care. Uh, for, for example, in the uh, experience uh, in uh, Thailand, maybe. Thank you. Maybe I just answer the question that gentleman has. I think you are asking for common features. Um, so from what I've heard, I, I think it, it, two things came to my mind. One is I think um, the, the, the involvement of volunteers in the community, you know, and um, because I think Mr. Cho's home care program has, and I think Thailand as well, and I think in Singapore we are also looking at you know, how, how, how do we get more volunteers involved? For instance, um, like for instance, we, we have this 
uh, we're starting to develop a, a group of volunteers called para care managers, for instance. So the use of volunteers. And I think the other one I hear a lot is home care. You know, but I, I think we, we need to define what home care means, actually, because I think home care actually refers to a spectrum of home-based care services. And it, it could range from um, home-based primary care, which is really bringing in medical and social care into the family, all the way to just providing personal care services. And that's also called home care. So I think when we talk about home care, we probably need to define that, that spectrum of care. But I think that is the, you know, so, so I think that seems to be the commonality, would be really a community-based care as seems to be largely anchored by home care. And that's why I hear. Yes, I, our model, uh, uh, as Kim Chu mentioned, uh, is a voluntary based home care model. Um, uh, because in our middle and uh, low income countries, uh, the budget has uh, limitations, so we couldn't we couldn't recruit any care workers, uh, paid care workers, because we, can, we cannot pay for their 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 salary uh, providing care at uh, for the older people. But uh, the initially, the volunteer-based home care was effective. And, and uh, the, I want to uh, uh, answer your question that uh, what, what we did in each country is that uh, as an NGO, uh, we went to the, the village and the build up this volunteer-based home care. And then uh, uh, we showed to the government that it is, it is necessary and then it is effective. In the beginning, you know, the government, the government didn't believe that we, in, in our country, in Myanmar, in Indonesia, in our country, we don't need formal care because family members are caring for their older people. But when we developed the model as a pilot, only, if, you know, the two or five Villages, we, we did the pilot project and then showed to the government that they see that there are many frail older people who who need care. Uh, the family members are busy; they have to go out to the go out uh, for work. If the family members stay at home, then they lose their earnings. So uh, at, after the government visit our 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 village and they see the model and they they start to change their mind. So I think this, this is the one of the way how to influence or encourage government to pay more attention uh, to this uh, system. Yeah, I want uh, to respond to your question. Uh, I think uh, because we live in the country, uh, we are the member of society. And uh, we encourage people to help themselves, but at some at some time or some 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 uh, situation, they cannot help themselves. They need help from outside. Uh, first, from their family, second, from community, and then from the country. So this is, uh, I think, this is the uh, uh, simple answer. But I would like to uh, to to give some example, like. Uh, uh, healthcare system uh, in in Japan in UK, I think UK is the first country to achieve uh, universal health coverage a few years after Second World War, because the because the the Labour Party is really really brave to announce to to improve the social welfare of the country. And one of the social welfare in the UK after after uh, after the war is the National Health Service, and they achieved just only three years after after uh, after the war. And this is a very good example because they start with a system that is is not so extensive, and then uh, the other country like Japan, Japan, Japan can achieve uh, universal health coverage in, uh, uh, in uh, 19, 
maybe 1961 1961 yeah 1961 yeah only 16 years after after the war after the war we, we know that Japan was destroyed almost the whole country but they can uh, recover and then they can achieve uh, USC within 16 years this is very good example this is, and and uh, and uh, UK spend about 9.5% of the GDP for USD with very good system. Japan also about 9.6%. Thailand, Thailand we now spend only 4.6% of the GDP, and we can achieve uh, USD 40 years after Japan. 40 years after Japan, and after, and, and only, only four years, four or five years after a, a big economic crisis. Yeah. But compared to the U.S., the U.S., they spend about 17.9% of the GDP, but can cover only 85% of population. Because they just uh, just leave the people to struggle to help for themselves. Yeah. That, so that's why I think that uh, if we can manage well, we should do. Okay. Um, the question for the PPP. I think in the in, in the morning session I, I gave a brief briefly some of my thoughts on PPP, but uh, let me give you some more thoughts. First, what do you mean by PPP? Especially, the, what do you mean by private in the PPP? Because private sector ranges from, for example, if you if you think of private as a non-government, then like a community-based work, it can be private. But usually, we all agree, especially in the context of long-term care, community-based organization, community initiative. So in that context, the private sector is fine, perfectly fine. But if you talk about the private sector for profit providers, there is very controversial issue. I mean, I'm an economist, so from an economic perspective, there are pros and, I mean, public sector and private sectors have pros and cons. Okay? We, need a, we should be careful. There are a lot of problems in the private sector because so-called market failure. The huge informational symmetry between the providers and consumers. So that kind of justifies the role of the public sector. But also, we, we also know that there is a problem of so called non market failure or government failure. Okay? So it's a very contextual issue. Some countries, different countries have different contexts. But in general, I can say that the the, the problem of informational symmetry is more severe in healthcare than in long-term care. So that's why the role, role of the private sector provision or private sector even financing tends to be higher in long-term care compared to healthcare. It's a relative speaking. But again, what do you mean exactly? It depends on, on your own on context. Okay? Second, the question of uh, long-term health care. I think, uh, I mean, there are a lot of, uh, again, the terminology, different people have different terminologies. But we tend to use health care and long-term care rather than long-term health care because long-term health care sounds like that health care provided for a longer time. But in, in, but in reality, you know, it's slightly different. I mean, I usually can say different ways. So... In, in the instead of the NCD, non-communicable disease management, or management of the health of all the people's perspective, there's more like a healthcare components mainly because it should be that part of the services should be provided by medical profession or health profession. So in that area, I think ICT can play a big, bigger role, okay? Because like a, like a diabetes management, blood pressure management, if you have a good ICT management or mobile health, smart health. Okay. They don't. The, all the people they don't have to come to the physician clinic, so they can send the information, and we have a kind of a smart 
kind of monitoring system. But in terms of a long-term care, like a social care component, a lot of personal care component, you know, we, we cannot, of course, ICT helps, but uh, compared to those kind of uh, healthcare components, the contribution, potential contribution of ICT, it cannot be, you know, we should not be too optimistic about the, the contribution of ICT to that sector. May I, may I, uh, yeah. Sorry. I, I just wanted to add this point. Uh, we didn't really talk about it, but I think it's really important. And, and that is really we need to define what long-term care means, you know, because I do not know whether all of our understanding is on the same page. And, and, and actually, for, for instance, when we look at the whole spectrum of care in, in, under long-term care, do, do you even include palliative care as part of that spectrum in, in, you know, in, in long-term care? And, and in our experience, we think that you know, for long-term care to be, to, be comp- to be effective, you really need to look at the development of primary care, for instance, and care management, you know, because these two are really care integrators. And I think the interface between long-term care and your healthcare system is equally important. Otherwise, your long-term care wouldn't work. So I, I think when we talk about investment in long-term care, we, we need to map out that, um, that, that framework that, what, that framework and that spectrum that, and, and the continuum that we are looking at. Yeah, you know, f- for it to make sense, really, I think. Yeah, uh, I am a health personnel. Uh, Dr. Sun is an economist. But uh, I am told, I am absolutely agree with Dr. Sun uh, about PPP. Uh, we ha- we have to be very cautious, especially when we involve a uh, health uh, system, because the healthcare is not the commodi- commodity goods; it's a public goods, and the information of the provider and uh, and and and. Uh, uh, purchaser is uh, really much different. Uh, it will be very costly. Uh, when we, uh, 10 years before we start the USC book lab in Thailand, uh, during our study preparation for quite a long time, uh, we conduct a meeting, a big, a big uh, meeting, about 300 participants. And we invite our a permanent secretary of finance uh, to speak uh, uh, for for uh, the uh, 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 for for the first the session. He came very late. We uh, we asked him to speak for uh, one hour, but he speak only ten minutes, and he said that he said very slow that. If we want to do uh, the health, uh, health insurance system in Thailand, don't involve public insurance company because they will make profit, about 50% profit. Don't do that. This is the message, a very short, <laughs> very short speed. Well, and, and if we look at uh, the U.S., why the U.S. spend really a, a lot of money for healthcare? Seventeen point nine percent of GDP that can cover only about eighty eighty five percent of uh, population, compared to Japan only nine point five percent, and can cover one hundred percent because uh, the government the government take uh, take a big role. Uh, to do, but in the U.S., the insurance company do everything, control everything. So the, the, we have to be very careful. PPP is uh, good in some in some instance, but in healthcare uh, system, we have to be very cautious. I also like to add some about the PPP. So, P- ex- apply the PPP in the area of social service pro- uh, provision is like uh, not so easy compared with the structuring, the infrastructure investment. So, um, 
it really depends how the contract is going to be built between the government side and the private side. There's a various type of the PPP, for example, built out to transfer or service contract, etc. cetera. Uh, depends on the contract, the different incentive is going to provide for the private sector as well. And then particularly if we're going to apply the PPP in the middle income countries, sometimes they do the survey about the willingness willingness to pay. However, the people, there's no services exist. It's kind of very difficult for the people to think about how much they want to spend. So this is reflected in the supply side analysis. It's very difficult for the private sector as well to think about if it is the really marketized areas or not. So then PPP is really not so easy straight to go ahead, uh, you know, the area. However, I know that some of the countries, not the OECD countries, that they already start to apply to the PPP model in the service provision area. So there is some market, I think, and also there is some possibility for the PPP. However, the message is not so straight. So we have to be very careful about the contents of the contract and scope of the services. So we would like to open the floor once again for the second round of the questions. You have, please. Thank you. <clears throat> well, the older persons, psychology that they want to remain in the family when they are not well, they want to remain in the family. And uh, any NCD, you see, they are uh, early stages and late stages. In the early stages, the family can very well take care of the senior citizens. In the late stages, they require some technical advice, technical guidance. So could the government uh, train a band of sub, sub workers to go to visit the fam families rather than bring the patient to the uh, super duper hospitals or institutions? So um, why not have a band of uh, trained personnel going to the families and uh, give a technical service and advice, you see? Rather than bring them in the hospitals. Thank you. If we have some more questions, I got one. Okay, please. I'm just a bit connecting with the, the, the question made there. And I would like, um, we were talking about ICT and its uh, uh, possibilities in providing healthcare. I'm talking back again about my mother, about whom I spoke uh, yesterday. Uh, as I said, she's 95, and she refuses to go to a elderly person's care facility and has said in, on a will, like living will, she shall not be taken to a hospital, but yet she shall be cared for. Uh, she had an episode a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, where uh, it was well, not possible to even find out what to do unless a doctor came to see her. And so an ambulance with an emergency facility came and said, but many more tests are required. And that's all possible in the hospital. Because in the hospital, and India has some fine five-star hospitals with doctors, everything is there. So the patient must come to the hospital so that the different doctors and different tests all can be done, but she refuses. And then my brother found, by looking into the internet in India, that there are portals now. It's like the Uber. There are home care providers who registered themselves so that if someone has a need, they can be connected. There are, of course, pathological labs which do all their work on ICT anyway. They're there. Even doctors are registering on these. And so he may call the number and said, you know, this is my problem. They organized doctor. Of course, lab he could go to on the lab came and took the sample and produced the result on the internet. And I found this was rather interesting. So there was home care being provided. And I say like Uber, it's a different model than, you know, training and having. Uh, and it was there. So it's emerging to me that I think there are possibilities uh, coming. But to the question about uh, your point I like, is in all this, it's like a private. All these people are private, by the way. And there's going to be money made and so. I thought two things were uh, required. One is a very poor person may not even be able to provide all that, therefore, to pay for all these services of the government's role. The second is the coordination role. You know, the judgment for the GP, finally we're missing like a GP to say which ones of these should I take. 
So if that could be uh, sort of given by the government so that the asymmetry of information problem, that the person is not choosing the wrong things, being directed to the wrong things. So I thought I wanted your thoughts about whether there's a model emerging here. Maybe. Yeah, but so perhaps I could share what are some of the programs that we have at the foundation and, and what we do at the foundation, you know, there are also other available services in Singapore. For instance, in the foundation, we have this, uh, what we call it the Huawei Mobile Clinic, but it really is home-based primary care, where we bring in a team of doctor, nurse, and social worker to, to, to serve um, older persons who are otherwise homebound. Uh, actually, in fact, the, our medical director is sitting there. You can talk to him later if you're interested, Wai Chong. Um, we, we run these services, and basically it's the kind of home care that you were talking about, where, you know, um, we, on a regular basis, the team will go in, you know, to, to take care of this person uh, with a, a, an assessment that comes with a care plan, and the care plan is reviewed every six months. And within the team itself, we also have a care management function, uh, which means the team, because it's only a very core team, right, you only have the nurse, the social worker, and the doctor. And you, the the the, the client may need, the older person may need other services. So the care management function in the team will bring in the other resources as needed to take care of, of, uh, of this person and the family. So that, that's one, one service that we have. The other service that we have is called the Elder Centered Program for Integrated Comprehensive Care. It, it basically is also, uh, the, the difference between this and the mobile clinic is that while mobile clinic is a home care base, home base, the EPIC really is center-based care, but it's center-based care for frail elders who would otherwise need to go to a nursing home. And what, what this center-based care does, it also, again, pulls together whatever services that the older person needs through a, a, a system of assessment and care planning with a multidisciplinary team. The only difference is that it's a day center where the older person will go to a day center a number of times a week. And, but it, it, it serves the same purpose in the sense that it, it basically provides care in the community for people, for frail elders, who would otherwise end up in a nursing home. So there are that, um, these services, service models available in, in the com that can be made available in the community if we organize services like that. And, and of course, like earlier, like I mentioned, what, what's really important is as you've said, the care management function, which is that care coordination, right? That, that, that function, whether it resides within one person or within the team having that, that mindset of care management function to bring together resources that are needed uh, by, by that uh, older person. Because no one service provider can provide everything that the person needs. So what you need to do is to understand what the needs are you know, and, and then bring them in, you know, bring in that resources, which means that actually care management will need to work with whatever resources there are in the, in the community, whether that resource be financial, uh, you know, uh, uh, medical, or, you know, uh, recreational, whatever resources that this older person needs for them to live, to, you know, um, to, to, to have their health optimized and to live as you know, as, as satisfying as they can be within the community. Yeah, so there are services like that. Um, I mean, we, we run a couple, of, we run some of those in the foundation. So, so really at the end of the day, I think it's very much how, how we organize the services uh, within the community, you know, because a lot of the services are organized in a very fragmented way. I mean, you, you know, we, we have just different, like a whole bunch of services in the community. But I think the, the challenge is really for us, how do we join the dots? You know, how do we know that all these services are available in the community, whatever resources there are and whatever services there are, how do we join the dots to make them into a complete whole, you know, as much as possible for the people we work with? You know, and, and that is um, you know, it's, it's the way we think as well. So, so it's really joining the dots in the community. You know, because like in Singapore, for instance, there are lots of services out there. And there are lots of resources, but you must know where to look and how to pull them together. But you want to do that based on needs, right? So, so the assessment becomes very important. The care planning becomes very important. And, and so like for us at the foundation, we have core teams. 
the core teams cannot provide everything. So we work with what we call virtual teams. There are teams out there. So how do we bring them in but work together as a team? And that care plan, the assessment in the care plan, really also serves to pull everyone together. Yeah. I think that there's some discussions, I mean, mentions the home care is better or home care is worse. But my perspective is all, it's all depend, it all depends. We, we should take into account the needs of the person. Because if you have a very severe disability, you cannot stay home. Other one, preference, what they want. Some people, some old person, I want to stay home. Others, no, 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 I, I want to stay in, in bigger institution. So our goal is to provide a whole spectrum of care available, such that all the person can choose based on their preference and need without financial hardship. I think that's our goal. Also, the role, but still in terms of, I mean, the, the design of the policy may have an impact on the people's choice. I mean, may bias the people's choice. For example, even in the same, we call the same long-term care insurance in Germany, Korea, Japan, but in details there are some differences. In Germany, they have so-called cash benefits available. In other words, if an old person becomes eligible for long-term care insurance, they can choose whether I can, go, I can use the long-term care providers. Again, even the long-term care providers, they can come to my home or I can, come, I can stay in their institutions, but they use the long-term care provider, service provider, reimbursed by long-term care insurance. Another option is, okay, I'll, I'll use cash. Give me cash. And then, usually in most cases, they give cash to the family caregivers. So in that sense, they have a choice still. So benefit package design may have an impact on the people's choice. And also in terms of this spectrum of services, Again, I mean, back to the question of PPP. What do you mean by PPP? Again, is it financing PPP or service delivery PPP? There's a kind of a consensus that the public sector role is very important for the financing. Because private insurance, there are a lot of market failures in the private insurance. So, so financing, public sector financing is important. But in terms of delivery, especially like this of a whole spectrum of different types of services, many times public sector is not as good because, you know, one of the advantages of private sector is innovations, local level innovations, responsiveness to consumer needs. In that sense, development or innovations in the whole spectrum of service delivery, private sector has many advantages. Like a home, it's not just a home, it's not just like I stay at my home. Another version is a, why, how about group home? Some of those older person, because I feel lonely when I live alone, but I can, I can, you know, like a, Four or five of friends live together in a, in a home, and we have some caregiver. There's some economy of scale. And then they can center, and then geriatric, I mean, long term care facilities, geriatric hospitals. In some cases, we have a community based system such that there's in, in a big community catchment area, one geriatric hospital, like a two or three long term care facilities, and then several daycare centers, even visiting care providers. Okay. But whole of this type of innovation sometimes works better in the private sector, like Uber kind of thing. Webs. Sometimes public sector is not, cannot quickly respond to those uh, uh, the needs. So I, I strongly support the public sector role in financing, but especially in the, in the long-term care service delivery, sometimes there's a lot of uh, private sector innovations. So we should, uh, we should not kill those innovations in the market. Um, under our volunteer based uh, home care program, there's a guideline, a guideline to select the older people who need this care. The first one is that, yes, of course, it has status. We provide this uh, home care uh, program pro uh, service to the older people who has difficulties in activity of daily living. But the second uh, uh, criteria is that the poverty. You know, um, a rich people can buy, I mean, the higher, uh, higher the, the care workers, even though in a low and middle income countries. Uh, so, uh, uh, and also the government money has a limitations, so we have to, you know, uh, 
uh, provide service to, for those who are poor family members. The last one is that uh, the older people who who don't have enough family caregivers uh, service. If all the people live uh, together with the uh, family members all day long, we don't we don't provide service because because family members can take care of the older people. But if you go to the, the, the field, there are many you know poor family members, uh, families that that uh, other family uh, the the members go out to get earnings. So during the daytime, during the daytime, uh, older people live live alone, and during the daytime they can get you know appropriate uh, care service. So uh, we have three. I want to share that we have three main criteria to select the beneficiary. Uh, again, I absolutely agree with Dr. Sun. We need continuum of care. It depends on the need of the person. Yeah. I'll I give you two short examples. A few months ago, I went to visit a patient at home. He is about 65, 65 years of age, and he has stroke. And then he admit to the provincial hospital. And after recovery, he need rehabilitation. So he went home. And a team, uh, a comprehensive team, visit uh, his home. Uh, he, uh, usually he stay uh, uh, at upstairs, the second floor, uh, as a rural, a rural uh, house. Yeah. But uh, he cannot climb up now. So. Uh, the team modify their house uh, so he can stay uh, 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 on the first floor and then modify the toilet for him and then uh, uh, construct a lot so, he, so they, can, uh, they can walk yeah, with support yeah. and they visit them sometime and they, uh, they uh, train they train uh, his uh, uh, his uh, grand, uh, granddaughter to encourage uh, him to rehabilitate. This is one example. Another example is not uh, an old person. Is, uh, she is uh, disabled. He has a congenital anomaly and, and, and she has a paralysis uh, uh, on, in the lower part. And she has suffered pneumonia for several times because uh, she breathes not well. So she has uh, pneumonia. So uh, the doctor visit her because uh, she go to the hospital uh, so often. And then uh, they, they try to prevent pneumonia. They buy, they buy her a karaoke so she can sing. So she can sing so she can exercise her lung. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the attack of the episode of pneumonia is lower. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. It's at the time is close to the end. So before closing, I think we all agree that the government should play some role. Although the middle-income countries, they have the limited budget um, available, then I'd like to raise the last question for each of the panelists. Based on the experience, please let us know what's the main opportunities and the priorities for the government in this region. Priority is to the most needy. Yeah, yeah to the most needy. Yeah, the priority. Mm. The government uh, need evidence, uh, and um, because they need uh, uh, to make it uh, a priority uh, in developing the policy and action plan. So, in that sense, uh, NGO uh, as an NGO people, we need uh, to provide those uh, the the evidence and also academia. And we need uh, a collaboration between the government and NGO 
and and the academy uh, to uh, provide uh, the evidence to the government to change their mind. I, well, I think the priority first of all, I think yes, the, the gathering of evidence of data is will be very important. You know, uh, yeah, so that we can we can make an informed decision and an informed plan, um, but. There again, I, 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 so, so that would really be the first step. And I think the next one is really developing uh, a, a framework, you know, looking and, and mapping out what is that spectrum of care that you're talking about, you know, that the, the, the society, the country is talking about. Who is involved in this spectrum? What kind of, uh, of profile of people we are looking at? And what is the end, where, where is the end that we are driving towards? I, I think these are questions that need to be answered. Maybe like... Um, uh, uh, he said that you know the planning is a dreaming part. The implementation is, is is the hard work. But I think we do need that planning. So, but but what goes into that planning will really be very very important. And and I guess when the the implementation, I, I guess different c countries have very different contexts because like in Singapore we we're pretty small, and and so in from that perspective, you know the our government takes a pretty lead role in that sense, you know, uh, in, in terms of, of developing um, services or the infrastructure. But I, I think, like I said earlier, that begs the question, then what is the role of the community and particularly that of the family? So, but, but anyway, that, that would really be the implementation. But I think maybe first and foremost would really be, be, that, be that planning, the, the data collection and, and really the conceptualization of, of that framework and who, get, who, who are we talking about, yeah. I think that the, in terms of financing, public sector, the government play a leading role. Okay, we cannot just rely on the private sector for the financing, but in terms of service delivery, uh, we should encourage the public-private partnership, and uh, private sector innovations can play a very important role. For the government, uh, long-term care system is not just a spending or expenditure. It's an investment. That means there, should, there can be a potentially huge benefits from investment in this long-term care system. However, how much of those predicted benefits realized? It depends on how effectively we design the system. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I, I will not summarize anymore, but it's very clear. So thank you very much for everybody. So I hope the, this discussion benefited the, our countries here in Asia. Thank you. <laughs>